In order to set a little background, this took place in Western Wyoming. It was a small town, and at the time it had maybe 2,500 people. This was the first home that I lived in during the time that I spent in Wyoming. We moved here because of my dad's job. The family and I weren't very enthusiastic because we loved our home in Oklahoma. My dad and mom went up and looked for houses without us so that we could finish school and wouldn't have to stay in a hotel. The housing market wasn't doing so well and the choices were very limited. In fact, it came down to one choice. The house that we had to move into was built in the 1930s and it was rather different from the house we moved out of. It was single story with a large basement. The staircase to the basement was immediately to the left when you walked into the front door. No door at the bottom and the steps were steep. It was fairly dark without any lights on. We move in within three weeks of being told that we're moving. My dad spent the first night there alone and never told us what he experienced until years later. We were about eight to 13 years old between my brother and sister, so he didn't want to scare us. He decided to sleep in the basement because the TV was down there and the basement was fairly large. He said that it was late, around 2 a.m., when the TV turned on to static by itself. He's not bothered too much by it, but then he hears a door creak open and some footsteps. After doing a little investigating, he lays down again, but doesn't sleep much due to weird noises. Jumping forward sometime, this would be my first odd experience that would make me a believer later on in life. Every night, my sister and I would pick a VHS movie from a large bookshelf in the basement. Since I was too afraid to sleep in my room in the basement, we slept in a bunk in my sister's room. My mom tells us that it's time to put in a movie and go to bed, so we agree to head downstairs. My first choice was one of my two favorites, which was The Land Before Time. I asked my sister, without turning around, does Land Before Time sound good to you? After about a minute, I get impatient, and I say, well, how about The Lion King then? Not much more time passes and I get upset, and I tell her, Fine then, if you're not gonna say anything, we're gonna watch my movie. As I slowly turn around to address my sister, I see that nobody is there. Here's the real kicker. I look back to the large bookcase and see two shadows, plain as day. My shadow, which is to the left, and a smaller shadow that clearly looks like a little girl on the right. This is when I realize something is not right and I freak out. After screaming and starting up the stairs, I take one final look back to see that the little girl is moving down the hallway to my room. Well, at least her shadow is. There was absolutely nobody in the basement to produce that shadow. The shadow disappears into my room and then to top it off, the light comes on. So I'm screaming bloody murder at this point and I run to tell my parents. They tell me that it was just my imagination so then I ask where my sister is, and they tell me that she's been in her room waiting for me to bring up a movie. Again, years later, I get told that they had both seen a little girl in the house too. They knew full well that it was not my imagination. The last thing that happened was to my brother. He had a room in the basement, but he wasn't a chicken like I was. One late night, he was woken up to his door creaking open. He thought it was me because sometimes I would get scared and come sleep with him. After a few moments, he said a small head peeked through the door. He said, what's wrong, buddy? Can't sleep? The door slowly shuts and he hears footsteps down the hall to my room. He decides to get up and come see what, who he thought was me, was doing. After leaving his room, he sees my light is on and my door is open. He walks into the room and every single toy from my wooden toy box is out. This is very unusual for me because my parents were quite strict and would kick my butt if I left my room like that. He asks me the next day what I was doing down in my room so late 
and I had no idea what he was talking about. My mom vouched that I was passed out in her room after we all watched movies. To sum up this story, my brother and I both had recurring dreams about a little blonde girl being stuffed into my toy box in the closet. Another dream that we both had was this kind of tall old man beating us in the basement bathroom. We've come to think that maybe a kid was killed in that house and the negative energy manifested because of that. Something I forgot to mention, all the toys were cleaned up the next day and were meticulously placed, all standing up in an odd order. Nobody in my family ever placed them like that, and no one had been in the basement aside from my brother, and he said that he certainly didn't do it. In any case, I'm really glad we don't live there anymore. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon and require a 45-minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal read, Closed. Absolutely no access to hot springs. Fines $2,000 max, or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things, and we figured that this was outside, so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs, and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle. June 20th, 1866. No way! A memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and, oddly, respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly, but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud, but peaceful. Though, ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums, 
My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling, as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our sight. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true, and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. The next morning, we packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the Memorial of the Diamond Battle. And maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident, and my sister's dad had committed suicide after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello, and what's up? We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed, and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little, and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl, and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night, though, I was having trouble falling asleep, and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep and for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared, but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm male voice say, Marissa, it's okay, just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. 
With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept and I told her that I was scared, but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me. But I told her, no, I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again. And I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice. And when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day, and I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door and I saw my dog. 
as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of societal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just a darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house. So I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me?
Years ago, I was living outside of Buffalo, New York, on an old estate on the Lake Erie shore. I rented the carriage house of an old mansion that a doctor and his wife owned. The doctor was a heart surgeon, and they were a well-to-do couple with multiple properties, so they weren't around that often. I liked the solitude of the place, having just gotten divorced, and although the carriage house was slightly decrepit, I loved living there. The mansion overlooked the lake, and my house was closer to the road, off of a private drive that went from one side of the estate to the other. The carriage house had been a servant's quarters for whoever lived in the mansion at the turn of the 20th century. There was an enclosed courtyard outside my door that was bordered by the back of my house, the carriage barn, which had stored carriages back in the horse and buggy days, a row of empty horse stalls, and a brick wall with an entrance to the courtyard. It was a very cool place to live. The rent was cheap, and there was a private 150-foot-long beach that was hardly ever used by anybody but me. But it was very isolated if there was nobody staying in the mansion, and there weren't any close neighbors because all of the houses along the road were big estates, and a lot of the rich people living in the area weren't full-time residents. But I was young and brave, and it was a big estate full of decaying spookiness, and I'm a weirdo that likes that kind of stuff. So I was overjoyed to find the place. One night, I was coming home late, around 1 a.m., from a friend's house. Driving down a street a mile or two from my house, I saw a dark figure up ahead, standing close to the road. I thought that was kind of odd, because it was late at night on a weekday, not exactly party time in the Buffalo South Towns. I started to get a little nervous, because the person was standing as if they were waiting for someone to pick them up. As I got closer, I could see they were wearing an unusual black shroud-like thing, long and dark and draped, with part of it wrapped over the person's head to look like a hood. It was similar to someone wearing an abaya or a hijab, only much looser, like a bunch of material just wrapped around somebody's body. It seemed totally inappropriate for what I knew of the people that lived around the area. Nobody ever wore anything like that and certainly not outside at one o'clock in the morning on a weekday. The person was just standing by the side of the road, looking stooped over and old. I slowed down to a crawl as I approached, worried that the person needed help. Maybe it was an older, senile person that had walked out of their house in the middle of the night, confused. When I got close enough to really see the person, she lifted her head and looked my way and I saw that it was my ex-mother-in-law. I was absolutely, positively sure that it was her. The same gray-brown hair, the same eyes, the same enigmatic smile that had always made me wonder what she was thinking about but never saying. She raised her hand and waved at me. Not a stop and help me wave, but more of a gosh, it's good to see you wave. That scared the hell out of me because my mother-in-law had died three years previous to when I was driving down that road. I sped up and kept driving, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. But a few minutes later, and a few deep breaths later, I told myself I should go back and take another look. My mother-in-law had loved me. I couldn't imagine her ghost would appear seeking revenge on me for divorcing her son, who had not treated me well, to say the least. I drove in a square by making left turns and went down the same road again, but there was no one there. I was too freaked out to go back to my spooky carriage house with the weird sounds and hundred-year-old history, with nobody there but me and the ghosts I was convinced probably inhabited the place. So I drove to the local all-night Greek diner and sat there for an hour, drinking coffee and calming my nerves. When I finally drove home and into the courtyard, I could see that something was wrong. My door was standing open. The glass windows were broken. The door was cracked almost all the way through from one side to the other. Someone had destroyed the door to get into that house. The next day, I found a crowbar in the courtyard, 
thrown off to the side. The only things I noticed missing from the house were just a few pieces of my clothing, super creepy, a jar of loose change, and a knife from the kitchen. I was just divorced and not exactly rich. I didn't have much worth stealing. It's very scary when someone breaks into the house you live in, all by yourself in an isolated spot. They must have driven right into the courtyard and would have been hidden from view while they broke down the door. I called the cops. They never caught anyone. With all the upset of the break-in, it wasn't until hours later that I remembered having seen my dead mother-in-law waving at me from the side of the road, dressed like the Grim Reaper. I'm convinced that she somehow appeared to delay me from going home, that if I had driven straight to the carriage house, whoever the person or persons were who had broken my solid wood hundred-year-old door practically in half with a crowbar might have been waiting there for me, or I could have surprised them, and that things might have turned out very differently for me. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? 
in the front yard. I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures. It just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black, silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son, on the same deck, at the same house. We have since moved, though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, Hey, there's no star there. It zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out, like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise. If I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc., and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. 
we built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient, cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning, shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large, rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther down river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree, and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more, it didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So, we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. 
it was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room. A black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. So I reached forward to pet him and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. 
the shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner, and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed, and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars, and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21 year old female in my second year of nursing and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m., I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods until it was completely covered. 
the feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful, and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset, when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second, and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter, because it was light enough to see the sky, and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was, until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double-checking the doors and windows, when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on, or what this thing is, and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me. So I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention, and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. 
But things got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow and this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone. Just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car, and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time, and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings-on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months, and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day. We found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway, on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed it was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, no doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like for some reason she couldn't trust the doctor or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, 
but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house, because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people, as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. I am Puerto Rican and I live in Brooklyn. But when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain within earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died, 
and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass, and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito, it had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside. But I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauko is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squires Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squires is said to be haunted. My whole life, I've said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, produced no sound, and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it. The lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle, and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. Then I remembered nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way, 
and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera. One friend was recording video on his phone and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, but my friends saw quite a bit. Watching his phone, my friend said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside, that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera. And sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it as it was very dark. But on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs. And on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. She said she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, 
There's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding. Stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stop in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking as it's all they could do. They keep going and sure enough, up ahead down the road, there's a parked car, the same as before. This time they are tripping out and they run up to it and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened, 
that I wish I could describe more about how it looked. But she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird, too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. In a harrowing moment, Reddit user Cherry Cranberries encountered a police officer who saved their life. But was it an officer or an angel? You decide. I was telling this story to someone today. I haven't spoken about this story in many years, but I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely 20 years old, living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school. And this particular day was very snowy, icy, and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying that they're heading to work. That's just New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road which I was driving on was a two-lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads here, there are no shoulders, and there was no turnaround. Once you were on this highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was the type of highway where if your car stopped, you were pretty much screwed because there was nowhere to pull off. Again, no shoulders or grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and a barrier in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's coworker had died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly, my car fishtailed, and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane, facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me. Like, coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my car was in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock. Like, how did that just happen? The tractor trailer blew past me in seconds. I mean, I would have been literal toast if I hadn't gotten to that shoulder. Breathing really heavily, I said to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver's side window. I open the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He says, hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now and his car parked right behind me in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that we had, which ended quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued and said, uh, You were going too fast. 
I said, yeah, I, I know. And then he says, in this soft but direct tone, stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so I can turn my car around the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it, but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember that my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to do that without his intervention. And slowly I pulled it back in the proper direction that I was supposed to be going in. I continued on and I looked behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on or the car themselves if they turn it off or whatever. But all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me to drive. It's weird to explain, but this cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. And like I said, there was nowhere for him to go. The only turnaround, that small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions, wasn't for another mile ahead, and the first exit off wasn't for another five miles. The small little shoulder ended up right where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in my mirror and saying out loud, where did he go? It was so odd that I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what had happened. Of course, in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer, I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse, how I have no recollection, and of the magical cop that showed up in 10 seconds and disappeared just as fast. My own parents thought that it was the strangest thing. I've told this story to a few people I know, and they've also thought it was weird. I think and my parents agreed that either that cop was sent by God at the exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back onto the highway unless I had taken a great risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone else hitting me while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter, and whoever it was, I won't soon forget it. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I have never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the ten of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. 
My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost ten years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick or treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night up to the old bendy spooky road you take up to the house and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. This scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around. But it still freaks me out to this very day.
I figured I would share my experience living in a 200 year old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. It dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the US. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. There were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23 year old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room and then it went down the wall and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here, on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, 
but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway, once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute, homey, and warm. I spend time there alone, and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to, though. Can't argue with results. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the Monument, as it was that before it was National Parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned road work sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light, a blue light, Possibly. It was miles and miles ahead. But that's the thing about the dark. Dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles. I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little, we joked a lot, the norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking, though, was why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. 
but we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely mines. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light. His face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent, but the saying as white as a ghost applied to everything about him other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness, in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life, but the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was, so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. 
They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down, and that helped as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open, and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker. It was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house, a boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. 
He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she'd left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. 
His wife was in the truck reading a book, and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about ten shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's, and one day she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock, and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it, and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch, and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light. Not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things, like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter but it was still her house, so I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy like she did my wife. I didn't believe in ghosts for the first 22 years of my life until I spent three months living in a haunted cabin. I always thought that there was some reasonable explanation for hauntings, and honestly, sometimes I still do. Maybe this wasn't a ghost. Maybe it was some kind of weird gravitational energy messing with things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My roommate and I, let's call him Derek, moved out to Colorado with meager savings into a small cabin that was pretty much out in the boonies. Our closest neighbors used their cabins as summer homes so we didn't really have anybody nearby. That's what's cool about living in the mountains, though. There's a sense of total isolation that you won't get anywhere else. You can turn off everything in your living space and hear nothing but the breeze. No highways, no car alarms, nothing. It's very peaceful. 
But after the first week or two in this cabin, Derek and I began to notice weird things happening. First, there was this eerie feeling that we would get. I remember Derek once joking with me that he didn't like being in the cabin alone because it gave him creepy vibes. There was one back room in particular where if you stood in it at night, you would feel like you were being watched. Sometimes I would come home from work and just have this sense of total dread and unease with no explanation. At the time, I wrote it off as me just being paranoid. You know, hallucinating stuff that isn't there because I wasn't used to the total silence and winter isolation. I started noticing things getting moved around as well. One morning, my car keys would be missing and I'd frantically search, only to find them in a weird spot, like on top of our refrigerator. I thought Derek was just messing with me, but he kept insisting that it wasn't him. Soon, he started having his stuff get moved too, and he would get really irritated at me, thinking that I was trying to prank him back, even though he hadn't pranked me in the first place. One night, we were sitting around playing video games, when something flew across our field of vision. We both looked at each other for a second, before realizing that we had both seen it. For context, the cabin was a typical A-frame, so for the most part, it was one big room separated into a loft and a downstairs, with the kitchen and our beds at one end, and the living room, TV, wood stove at the other. Whatever small object flew across the room had gone from the kitchen all the way to the front door. We examined it closer and found out that it was a single green bean from our meal that evening. We kind of held it up and looked at it for a second. It had flown all the way across the house, from the stovetop in the back, all the way to our front door. We really didn't have anything to say about it. It was just super weird. The next morning though, was when I knew our house was haunted. I was watching some TV in the front room, when BAM! The roll of paper towels we had sitting on our kitchen counter flew into the table and knocked a glass of water everywhere. The roll had been thrown with force, to the point where I thought Derek had tried to chuck it at me. I turned around to tell him off, but then I realized he wasn't there. He'd been in the shower the whole time, getting ready for work. I felt a chill go down my spine. Some force, spirit, ghost, whatever, had thrown this thing across the room. Derek didn't believe me when I told him, and I couldn't blame him, but he soon came to his senses. The next couple of months were crazy. Everything from car keys to full decks of cards to box cutters would be thrown around our apartment right in front of our eyes. We'd hear weird growling sounds at night that sounded like they were right in the middle of our house. To be fair, sound carries strangely in the mountains, so maybe we were just hearing some nearby animals, but still. One time, my roommate stormed out of the shower, furious. What the heck, he said. Why would you turn the lights out on me in the shower? I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. But by far the most frustrating thing was how our stuff just kept going missing. I mean, it got ridiculous. One night we left our car keys in a very particular spot just to see if they had been moved in the morning. When we woke up, they were gone. But not just that, they had been tucked between the pages of To Kill a Mockingbird on our little bookshelf. It took us hours to find them. Another morning, I could not for the life of me find my phone. We tried calling it, and it would ring, sounding loudly throughout the house, but we couldn't pinpoint the exact spot. Finally, we tracked the ringing to the bathroom, but it sounded like it was coming from behind the wall. The vanity sort of hung there, so I thought, Eh, it's probably in the wall, seeing how weird everything's been. Maybe there's a hole or something. I took the vanity off its hanging nail, and as soon as I moved it, my phone slid out the back and clattered onto the floor. Derek and I looked at each other, 
and his face was totally pale. How is that even possible? The haunting got to the point of just being silly. We had a friend come visit, and as soon as she opened the door, my car keys were thrown in her face from across the room. She was like, wait, is the cabin haunted? We kind of joked that, yeah, things get thrown around sometimes and you just have to ignore it. She didn't want to stay there anymore. And that was the point where I asked my landlady if she could provide some history on the cabin we were renting. She got really defensive about it and said she had owned it for years and nothing weird had ever happened there. Long story short, we got evicted a couple of months later. I don't really want to go into it because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. But yeah, the uneasiness persisted until we moved out. Although in the last month of living there, the ghost chilled out on throwing objects at us. I still don't have a concrete explanation for all of the weird things that happened. But I definitely believe in ghosts and other things that we don't understand. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, trembling, and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep, horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now, as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints. He almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal but next to it was this big tree or bush, and in a separate tone and position was this old four-door sedan, parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside, 
almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows, because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately I felt the back of the ambulance get colder and there were goosebumps on my skin. At first I thought it was a security light or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there, and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway, still with those eyes staring, and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the street lights, I could not see into the car. I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us, over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed me watching and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes but they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly, but out loud, go away. You are not touching this man. This man is my patient. And if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off as one went onto one off ramp and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks, but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that Whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night and it was horrifying. I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's going to be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. 
my father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away and please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below. And on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock. And while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death, though, my mother never wound the clock again, and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click, followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks and suddenly the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. That sound I heard before wasn't grinding, it was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave. And then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs. 
and finally all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick-tock, tick-tock. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, Were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly, my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh, my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you, too. And we miss you. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee, and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall, with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black, but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel, where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. 
I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse. Eventually, the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird, bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time, their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night. But I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room, and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them, and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general. But who knows? I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens.
My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager and only on a brief trip. When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment. She was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no, I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh. She was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like, how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late thirties, maybe early forties, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us as if they knew us too. Ah, oh, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us, but there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed up to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye. Uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks, but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. So weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. She looked up from her phone when we got in line and then went back to minding her own business as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was, and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea, I said finally. 
Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us, but I mean, what are the odds of that? And that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us. This story was posted to Reddit by user Werniver Klimt, who tells about a theater with a ghostly reputation. Here's the tale. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poli Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, a peeling mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out, 
and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door, though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater, and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with a loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason. But nothing. Mike who? I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead, silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago, and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently, almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted, 
and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida, so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by. Some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point. But also other things like the cat acting strangely and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house, particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day, though, something was especially creepy. So creepy, to me, in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. Something that will stick with me forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over, so I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or were out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again. However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her, but we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. 
About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend. And we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now, and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brothers. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement, but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read, general store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, 
and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-styled dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. 
the farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moment scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There's no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. 
that light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically. And then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large century house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom, and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff, always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, 
but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat, so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it, and as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, so much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there. For a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could sense supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal. So I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard, and I saw out of the corner of my eye my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. 
And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again and the current residents have stayed there the longest. I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there, and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. 
while outside on the balcony. The door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th. Our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in Old House, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, Good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. So, I'm a pretty skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in the tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and stories on Reddit. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House, the Molly Brown House, the Whaley House, Alcatraz at Night, the Winchester House more than once, and none of them have yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe, but is also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer, 
up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to hit the slopes. It was January, so it was still winter time at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people, or five couples. One entire lower floor basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. Also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California, with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing peculiar about it and there are other people staying around. Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room, and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in the story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn about the large and cozy living room and the family room where we imbibed. It was almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings, except toward the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that it was the balloons getting attracted toward the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that popped were congregated near vents. I just took note. I didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night and all the lights were off, we could hear balloons popping downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. The next morning, there were still plenty of healthy balloons strewn about. Fast forward to night two. After we return from snow activities, we prep for drinking and the usual. After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we're all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night, and we decide to retire around 11.30 to midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat or heater. Our couple friends across the hall had their door slightly open ajar. The lights were on and the bathroom was in use. As I'm going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak. I figure it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point, and the creaks continue. And then, I hear it stop a few feet behind me, near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on, and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, What's up, dude? Need something? I turn around, and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched, and it is indeed every bit as dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback, and my skeptical self once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I went back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass, and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple of notches. Nothing crazy. I turn on the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and stop once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd that creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the foosball table, several feet away near the fireplace, audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around, and I am certainly too far away to touch it. 
I froze in fear and hastily went back upstairs. Somehow I went back to sleep, not even knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually fall asleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought up by my girlfriend's friend and couple who stayed across the hall. I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and I disclosed them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale, gets really serious, and tells us that the previous night she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode after blinking and realizing that it wasn't a dream or a hallucination. She shook her boyfriend awake, the guy that I thought had followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear when he woke up. This by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin who stayed in the room next to us then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds of the walls of the cabin. These events stand alone could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively, it's really hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping that this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal, because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe has made this skeptic more of a believer. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile, deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day, and I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still. The birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent. So I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs, we prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. 
the wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank-out windows that were popular in the 70s, when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know, he whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just going to pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, Well, what would you like to know? You know what that was. Your dad knows. I know. We all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was. And frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. 
I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. In this story, Reddit user Pineapple Juice tells us some strange tales about the house she grew up in. Here's the story. So back when I was about to start second grade, me, my mom, and my sister had to move to the next town over because my sister had gotten into a fight. This was the town my mom grew up in and where my grandparents lived. I don't know why, but my mom kept on choosing the much older houses in the town, like before 1900s old. I personally didn't care, until we got to the house. I remember the absolute nervousness I felt when I walked into the house. I felt like I was being watched, and I absolutely hated it. When we got to what was going to be my room, I felt decent, I guess. I stayed in there for most of the tour, I believe. Maybe I was taking in my surroundings, but I remember that I liked the walls, and before I left, I waved and said goodbye. I felt as though I had to say it. When we were leaving, we had to drive across the front, and in the second attic, there was a window on every side of the house. There was this girl who was translucent and very old-timey looking. She was gray, but where her eyes were supposed to be were a dark gray, and what I could only assume was blood dripping down her face. Well, once we moved in, I remember that this is where my talking habit I have yet to break comes in. I would just talk and talk for hours. I would explain what I was watching for absolutely no reason, even when nobody was there. Well, one night after we got completely moved in, I decided to knock on the floor. I got a knock back, and I remember that it made me feel not so lonely. This happened until I was a solid 10 years old, and I think that's where everything began to go downhill. That's where everything started. The feeling of being watched intensified. I never felt alone. When I was about nine and in the third grade, I went to sleep at a decent time. I never really had before. I woke up facing away from the door. It was odd, and I felt eyes practically burning into my back. I turned and guess who I saw? The little girl. She couldn't have been much older than me at the time. I remember my fear, how I felt, how her not eyes followed me. Eventually, I got the courage to walk past her and into my sister's room. She told me that I was dreaming and that I should go back to bed. And when I got back to my room, she was gone. But this is when the activity really began. I would see a female and a male shadow person. I brushed it off at first. I thought I was just crazy. So I would just move past it and stop worrying about it. I swear that little girl played with me. Dolls, superheroes, outside, all of it. No matter where I was, no matter how I was playing or what I was playing with, there she was, messing with things, playing alongside. I swear looking back that I could hear a woman's hum sometimes whenever I would try to sleep. We'll get this. My sister's now husband, at the time boyfriend, slept in my room while I was at my grandparents, and he supposedly saw the little girl. And once my sister heard the story, she was like, oh my gosh, my sister wasn't lying. And her boyfriend was like, that is weird. My sister always hated going past my room to the bathroom, but like everything else, we just moved past it. My godbrother, who's about two years older than me, saw a little boy with me that I couldn't see. 
Well, one time we were joking around with some fake Ouija board on my phone, and it led us to what we called the front room. I kid you not, there was a little boy who was exactly the same as the little girl in our window, who just smiled at us and waved. We got out of there. I remember that any time I felt sad, I knew I wasn't alone. Any time something was wrong, I always felt safe. I felt loved. But I know that right before I left the house, right up until I was gone at 11, maybe 12 years old, I would always stop if I saw a shadow or a figure. I'd go back to where they were and wave a hello before I continued. Before my mom and I moved out, because my sister's a grown woman now, I knocked on the floor one last time, and I got a slight tap. And just then I said goodbye one last time before we moved out. That house had a lot more things happen to it as well. For instance, the old owner once came by to check it out and ask questions, but nobody remembers the guy before us coming to the house. I remember him vividly. All in all, the house I grew up in was very haunted. I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but I've also been a skeptic. I'm not one to jump to paranormal conclusions right away. With that said, this event messed me up, and it still keeps me up at night to this day. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically in Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically right in the middle of nowhere. The boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She has always told me that her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out. You know, freak out the city boy. That is, until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot, and her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with the nearest house well down the road from us. One of those nights, around midnight, I'm sitting in bed with her completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube notifications when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice. I turned to look at her to see if she was sleep talking. Nothing. She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. But this time it doesn't sound like it's coming from her. It sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, but much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if there's a TV on or if the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction that I heard the voice coming from. But nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand, to my right, in case it was playing audio or something, but it was just charging. I go back to bed with her and I continue going about my business, but this time I'm kind of looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder, and it sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice. It was for sure coming from outside this time. I know this because she was sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall. On the other side of that is a clearing, and it's all dense woods. After this, I focused all of my attention to the loud voice to see if I would hear it again, and I'm looking at her to make sure that it's not her. This is the part where I internally started saying, I am not finding out what you are. 
I have seen way too many movies and YouTube videos, and I'm not about to go out there and find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, but just a little farther, which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that really had me freaking out is that it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words were making sense. It's almost like it was trying to speak English, but it was reversed. At that point, I did one final check around the interior of the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking, it was probably just some lost person in the woods, definitely not a skinwalker or whatever else. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up just cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after and a lot of my friends threw around the thought that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend's who studies cryptozoology as a hobby asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it though, because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in that garbled speech. I'm not too sure on that much, but it was like it was luring me into the woods. Whatever it was, it got my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, patterns, everything, just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me to go out there with it. Of course, I was looking at her, so I knew it wasn't her. Who knows what I might have done, I guess, if she hadn't been in the room with me. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and go to Disney World with her family. I'm hoping that whatever it was, isn't there anymore. I saw a fairy portal once and I almost went through it. I was nine years old and it was the week before school. I was depressed about classes starting because kids had started to bully me. My mom took me on a day trip to the local preserve. When we arrived there, there was a bus load of elementary school kids and my heart sank. I was noticeably chubby and kids were always cruel about it. This was the 1980s and fat phobia was intense. So we walk along the main path full of kids. My mom could instantly charm children, so they loved her. But when she wasn't looking, the kids would say mean things to me. So I wandered off the main trail and I found this Indian trail. It was very distinct in spite of a lot of undergrowth. It passed between two trees that arched toward one another, almost like a doorway. And then I came to this huge hedge. It was too high for me to see over and it stretched all the way from the Indian Trail to the main path, seeming to cut across the forest. The Indian Trail led right up to it, and there was a fissure, just wide enough for a child to fit through. I peeked inside, and it was so lusciously green and cool, and this was a stifling hot day, Nebraska heat, humid and oppressive. It was unusual to find some place that cool in the forest, given all the heat and humidity. I squeezed into the fissure, set my foot on the earth on the other side, and it was soft and moist and springy, unlike the hard, baked, sandy earth of the main forest. What I saw remains the most beautiful place I have ever seen. The sky was pearl blue. There was a vivid green bank sloping down to a dry creek overgrown with ferns. A huge fallen tree trunk spanned the ancient creek like a bridge. On the other side was a forest of silvery trees, the most inviting thing I've ever seen. Peaceful, 
wondrous. All the sounds from outside were hushed. No gabbling children, no nothing, just peace. It filled me with joy, and at that time of my life, I had precious little that made me happy. Now, I had braced my hand on the outer wall of the hedge, and my other foot firmly planted in the hard, sandy, real part of the path, because somehow I knew that if I put both feet on the ferry side, I could never go back. It was so hard not to walk into it and start exploring. I truly felt the place call to me, and I have never wanted anything so badly than to cross that tree bridge and explore the silvery forest. Even the air felt different, moist and sweet, I felt a light, gentle mist touch my face as I closed my eyes and breathed in deeply. But then I thought of my mom. Could I really just leave her behind? She had had a sad life too, and I thought it would be a gift to show her this place and we could go in together. Well, as I had that thought, the fissure in the hedge began to close, pressing against my stomach and back. I was forced to choose go forward or go back. I pulled myself back out of it with an effort. The hedge branches caught my t-shirt and tore a hole. Branches scraped my arm, drawing blood. I went back down the Indian trail, past the two trees entwined like a doorway, and found my mother on the main path, still talking with those brats who'd had the nerve to bully me when she wasn't looking. I insisted that she come with me to see this most glorious thing, she didn't doubt me and was willing to follow me, only now it was really difficult to find the Indian trail in the undergrowth. It was all overgrown and covered in leaves, but I spotted it and I made it as far as the two trees that were like a door. Only now they were strung with nasty cobwebs, like the trees were suddenly so old and ugly I couldn't imagine going near them, and the trail had disappeared entirely. I looked up and pointed in the direction of the hedge, sure that she could spot it from there. It was nine feet high and stretched for several yards in both directions. But no, there was nothing, only the usual trees and undergrowth. I was so shocked when it wasn't there. I saw then that it was impossible that it had ever been there. It would have been bisected by the main path, which was packed with children and teachers. I was speechless trying to get my mother to understand what I had seen. She didn't doubt me, and she said, maybe it was just for you to see. I felt such a profound feeling of loss, like really inconsolable loss. Probably at the end of all my days, I will still think of that place. That was my chance to enter the fairy realm, but I turned back. I've never shared that story, I thought that if I ever had children, I would tell them about it, but that hasn't happened, so I thought I'd share it here. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. 
I think nothing else about it after that, and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions. All different. Old men, old women, younger adults, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, so I grab my rifle preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night and I've never done it since. Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. 
Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour, which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement, which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15, and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh. I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in, back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power, therefore there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately, so naturally, I turned on the EMF. It was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, 
but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable, strong force pushed me into tea. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend, as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday, but those stories are for another time. I always wanted to share this story, but I've never done it before, so here goes. This is a story from long ago, before crawlers were a thing that people talked about that much, before the internet exploded, and that annoying modem sound came on if you were lucky enough to have a computer and an internet connection. It was around 1999, and I was living in very rural upstate New York. If you don't know, or you've never been to the area of the Catskill Mountains, it's small town after small town, surrounded by forests and farmlands. Not much to do back then, but hang out with your friends and drive around. At least, that's what I did with my friends, besides the weekly house party. My best friend and I were very into the paranormal back then, and we both experienced many unexplained things our entire lives. Being in our late teens, young adulthood, we just decided we were curious, and at the time, we also both identified as Wiccan. We spent a lot of time in those woods. We would meditate, do earthy spells, have lunch, and camp out. So, needless to say, we were not afraid of the woods, the dark, or being completely isolated in the middle of nowhere. One night, on one of our late winter drives to nowhere, we ended up on a road that we hadn't really been on before. We pulled off on the side to where this old schoolhouse was. We parked the car, got out, and looked in the windows to check it out and see what was inside. It appeared to be kept up as a historical site. There were old desks inside, and old chalkboards, things like that. It was really neat, but we did have that creepy feeling that you get at places where the veil is thin. So, of course, we returned there several times after. We were just drawn to the place. A few times, we went during the day with some other girlfriends to check it out. As we took a walk in the woods behind the schoolhouse, we all felt this odd feeling. The only way we could really describe it was like what I've heard of as walking through a fairy circle. The ambient lighting around us felt different. I can't really describe it, other than almost more of a vivid color experience around us as the sun came through the trees. We didn't think we were there all that long, maybe an hour. But when we returned to the car, it had been several hours and it was early evening, maybe around 5 or 6 p.m., and we'd gotten there at noon. One of my best friends and I went at night again. We were sitting in the car, just talking, drinking our gas station bought cappuccino purchased for our night drive, and we kept hearing this tap, tap, tap sound. Out loud, I said, knock it off, to the nothing that was there. Right as I say this, we hear what we could only describe as children's feet running away from behind to the side of the car. That little pitter-patter that only kids can make. It freaked us both out and we got the heck out of there. There was no way that anyone was there. Like I said, this was a rural main road to a dirt road pull-off. Completely pitch black. No street lights. No cars going by in the distance or anything. If someone did show up, they would have been walking in the dark for miles to get there. And it certainly wouldn't be a child. It's kind of sad when I think about it now. I certainly hope it wasn't a roaming spirit of a child, gone too soon from this place. Anyway, that's where the freakiest part happens. And we never did return to that old school after this. 
As we're getting back onto the main road, there in the headlights, we saw something scurry across the road quickly. It looked like a hairless, naked human, crawling low to the ground, its elbows bent so high that its belly was close to the road, like a grasshopper, and its knees looked like they were bent backwards. I remember us both turning to look at each other with that panicked look on our faces. We then said, What the heck was that? Did you just see that? What the heck was that? We drove home kind of trembling and not saying a whole lot. I remember I kept looking in the rear view mirror, half expecting to see this thing chasing us down the road. Luckily, we did not. My friends and I are still best friends to this day, and we sometimes talk about this series of events. Years later, we saw the movie The Descent, and it immediately made us both think of that old schoolhouse and the thing that we saw run across the road that night. It was a freaky place, experience, and time. Also exciting and slightly terrifying. I now live across the country, far away from New York, but I often wonder about that old schoolhouse and those woods. Someday, I think I would like to return, now that I'm older and in a different place in my life. I would like to see if it's still there, and just see how I feel about all of it now. But I would never, ever want to see that thing that we saw so many years ago. It all happened during November of 2017. I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I, that were assigned to the same room, decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient-looking lobby, and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4am, I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold, so I got up to relieve myself and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired, and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, but this time I did look through the peephole, because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them while something was trying to get into the room. 
I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside, until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked. I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day, until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real-life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju kurong without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door, and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, but she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear, but before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again, instead of levitating, behind them, and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room, but we realized it was locked from the inside, so we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it, they told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts? Mold? Our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. I'm a female, and I was hanging out in the car last night at about 5 in the morning with my best friend, who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city, so we were trying to find a flat, high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east, until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation, because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly, there weren't any buildings or lights around at all, just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead, by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was, and I said, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that, but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped, and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end, and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet, and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot, like that feeling just before you pass out. Almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. 
It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough. It's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker. Like, unnaturally dark. I got this feeling that just kept telling me I have to get us out of here right now. Turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her, but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead, speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first, but apparently in the moment we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. Heidi said something like, Maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but no logical human explanation feels sinister enough. I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end sign, the woods get thicker and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this non-profit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something, and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and, stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor, and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. 
This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside. My husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never set foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, 
The boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multi-family home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside, because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, the person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering recurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in 10 times he really did want a single, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the start of daylight savings. So at 1.59 a.m., the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of two. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. I was the only phleb on nights and I worked with two techs. I sighed and showed them. Oh look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or if he wants the serial draw. I went up to the floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy, and I thought his loud, ugly pants just drew attention to his loud, ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey, I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three serial draws? He was dismissive and said something like, of course I did, can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just come poke a patient three different times without orders, so I asked him if he could reorder it and I would go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back and do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly knowing that he would take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58 and the orders were there, so I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized that he had ordered the single draw yet again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to do this order exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he had been when I came up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed somebody had forced him to change and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now, it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him again. I asked him if room 2008 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had changed his clothes. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, sorry to offend, but when I came up to you earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I just assumed something happened. He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. 
I'm thinking he's just being weird and should just admit he got puked on, but whatever. I go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment, and on my way back down, she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight, right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend he wasn't. She told me that he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change, and then walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing wearing black. I was weirded out and went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients that I had drawn after first asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge I had left them in and they weren't there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was and didn't have cotton or tape on their arm from where I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this. It appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight saving starting. That is completely a societal construct. Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get the chills when I think or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned into the clocks and to know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes. When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences, and I joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern of lead paint, and not a lot of historic value either. Everything went smoothly, for the most part. Our toddler would awaken in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant with another kiddo quickly, and he went out of country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, six to 12 month age range, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry or point behind me when I was doing dishes. I didn't think it was too weird. My husband returned and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years old at this point and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point and continued to be convinced for about two years. It's hard to remember the time frames for everything, but I will describe the activities that occurred during this two to three year period. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. I would later find it in the same spot that I always kept the medication. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet and that she was afraid of him. So we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt that they were perhaps lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, 
we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry waiting to be folded on the chase, but decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch The Breakfast Club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chase and hit me in the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up and he said that he didn't believe me, but I know better because he got really anxious and couldn't sleep after that. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew that that couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as being all black and pointed and said, he's right there. He's right behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things happen that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kids' room and get a terrible feeling whenever I would go and check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs would also sometimes bark in the hallway. I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at our door, freaking out. I worked weekends and I would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go and shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said that I had already been home and talked to him about my day. I had then told him that I was going to go shower. So when he then heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well. An entity taking my identity made me feel helpless. A coworker got me in contact with her friend who has special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put quartz crystals in the corner. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracted transient spirits and entities, some good, some not. The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that it was a big focus of the negative energy. They taught me to smudge and told me that I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasion after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved in it. We kept it on our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at us at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact it's still a treasured item that we have to this day. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. And the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that it was haunted. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed, and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area, 
where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old Western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open, it drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog foaming at the mouth came up to me once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things. And while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks, and then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. 
I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry. Maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training, too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although, I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. Up until the point of 2008, I wasn't okay with the supernatural, nor did I put much stock into it. I was already socially awkward enough as it was, and I was stuck in that awful teenage phase of not like other girls, but I also didn't think that I was special enough to see ghosts, an idea that I would come to regret. I'd really be okay now if I never saw one again. For more context, after we had moved into this house during the summer of 07, my parents noted that I had undergone a significant personality change. I was suddenly nasty, aggressive, abusive to people who had never harmed me before, even to my friends. Previously, I was just a goofy kid that teachers didn't quite know how to talk to, but I was otherwise considered very bright and pleasant to be around. I was no stranger to moving every other year, and this move had barely bothered me, so they knew I wasn't just upset. It was late one night, my dad was away for work, and it was just me, my mother, my little brother, and my dog that week. For some reason, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I sat up in bed to see a dark figure standing in the corner of my room, almost indiscernible at first glance. I didn't yell. I didn't panic at first, because I thought that I had to be dreaming. I wasn't special, and non-special people don't do cool things like see ghosts. I tried to fall back asleep, but it was pretty tricky, and I felt like I was being watched for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked to sleep in another room, slightly more fearful now, but thinking I just needed a change of pace. It was a fluke, and by sleeping elsewhere, my brain would reset and I would be fine. I had not just seen a ghost. My mother thought that I was acting up for attention, but figured it wasn't the hill to die on and let me sleep elsewhere. So I did. That thing followed me. It waited at the foot of my bed all night, staring me down as I tried to sleep. I was so exhausted from the lack of sleep the previous night that I did manage to drift off, but it was a restless sleep. I tried to envision myself surrounded by white light, like the Tolkien elves, hoping that it might repel the darkness. The third day, I was sat at the table with a few friends and their mothers and my own family. We had just had dinner and were doling out the cinnamon rolls, when I suddenly felt my whole body get heavy, like somebody had just added a 50-pound weight to my skull. I couldn't stop it. I slumped forward in my chair despite my grabbing at the back of it to stay upright. My eyes just about rolled into the back of my head. Someone asked me if I was okay. I couldn't see. I couldn't see, and yet I could. I suddenly saw a flat plane stretched out before me, and everything was gray. The dark figure stood right in front of me. And then it rushed me, 
It ran at me so fast I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. I had to fight to pry my jaws apart, and I screamed. It was like the screaming released me, and I about knocked my chair into the wall I shot back so hard. I was sobbing, and I could hardly catch my breath, while everyone tried to figure out what was wrong. I told my mother what I saw, that the thing was back and that it tried to hurt me. I think this finally convinced her that I wasn't crazy, that something was wrong and I wasn't just trying to get attention. I wasn't a crier, I hated being caught crying. After I was calmed down, she took her two friends upstairs with her to my room. She didn't tell me until several years later that her friends had seen it, had seen this dark presence in my room, could prove that I wasn't lying, that I wasn't crazy. The dog often followed her around the house while she was doing chores, but he refused to go anywhere near my room. He actually growled at my room, hackles raised kind of a growl. Even after we moved to a new house, my dog never wanted to stay long in my room again. I don't know if it was because he remembered the bad thing from before, or if something had been irreparably broken in me, or was now a part of me. I couldn't walk into churches anymore without having sudden, unexplainable breakdowns. I would feel like hands were choking me. I would struggle to breathe. I would feel a hundred emotions at once and start sobbing. Needless to say, I quit entering churches after more than a few bad experiences. We found a journal in my room a few months before I moved out for uni, full of crazy ramblings, written by something that said it was a monster, that my parents would unalive me if they discovered I was no longer human that it would have to hurt my family first to stay alive. I burned it immediately, and I tossed the remnants into the trash can. The scariest part of that was, all of it was in my handwriting, and yet I don't remember writing any of it. My family still wonders to this day what it was. Germany is small, and so many new things got built on top of old things all the time. We lived close to Celtic tombs, had visited old mounds and tall obelisks mounted on them. We lived next to a walled city. Buildings in the village could be dated back several centuries prior, and were still inhabited by people today. Maybe our home was on top of someone's grave. The weirdest coincidence of all was that the people who had lived there before us had developed a reputation of being quite nasty as well. I wonder if they'd always been that way. Or if maybe the same thing that happened to me, and changed me, changed them, too. This happened when I was around nine or ten. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before, and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Cat and I are laying on a bean bag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. 
Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home. It's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty and no one found them for months afterwards, in this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day, but I've never seen the lady. But you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Kat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Kat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then 
I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws, but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe she was one of the ones that never made it out. It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact. The most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the Panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive, and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street that was fairly busy all day a stoplight only a block away from us. A very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there. Old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere. But that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery, complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, 
but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, clearly not hearing the screaming, and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, But... And she said quietly, There's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman, nothing. It happened so fast, I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom and she said under her breath, I told you not to look. And gave me this look that said, don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything but just listened to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. 
Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt this shock wave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was. Through my younger years, from about 7 to 12, my mother dated a guy very on and off, which I think mostly had to do with him being in the army and staying with his family in Laredo, Texas whenever he was home. Either way, he invited us to visit his cousin's summer cabin in Monterey, Mexico for a weekend, so we did. The cabin was very ranch style, longer in one dimension and shorter in the other so it was built like an architectural rectangle. On one far side of the building, think of this in an aerial view, was the kitchen, and next to it was the living room. Attached to the living room was a long, slender hallway connected to bedrooms on each side and a bathroom on one of the sides. The backyard was only accessible through the living room via a sliding door, and what started as a bit of the desert floor, met by a forest's tree line, although there weren't a lot of trees, mostly it was dead and dying Monterey cypress trees. Meeting the so-called tree line was an elevated hunting tower. Its platform met the top of the vertical tree line. On our way to the cabin, my mom's boyfriend was telling us about a cursed legend of the witches of Monterey. Apparently, they had been haunting the mountainous area for generations and were his childhood version of La Girona. Clearly, he was trying to scare us from the get-go. And me being so young, I was eating it up like candy. We got to the cabin in the late evening, so we decided to stay in for the night and watch M. Night Shyamalan's The Lady in the Water. After the movie, my mom's boyfriend asked me to go get something from the bedroom for him, and as I was halfway down the hallway, he turned the lights off on me. Let me remind you 
that this was a very rural part of Mexico. So the dark was dark. So with all the scary stories and the, at the time for me, scary movie, I was spooked and I froze. My mom's boyfriend began to make your stereotypical ghost noises and taunted me to go deeper into the dark hallway. But I was so petrified, I remember just standing there, frozen in fear. Long story short, my mother got onto him and he turned the lights back on. They comforted me, and after a few apologies, we all went to bed. I can't remember how I slept that night, but I honestly wish I did. The next day, we did basic tourist things. Went to a bazaar, embraced the city's beautiful mountain range, which seemed to hug the city, ate authentic Mexican food, and visited the main hub of the city. When the day was all done, we decided to call it and went back to the cabin. What's strange is that I remember the night before so vividly, but I can't remember much about this night other than what I'm about to share with you. I was in the living room of the cabin, and I remember my mom's boyfriend was there with me. He asked if I wanted to go up into the hunting tower out back with him, and I said yes. I remember following him through the back door of the living room, and I remember him walking ahead and turning back to wave me toward him. I thought he was just trying to help me keep up with him, so I followed him. I watched him climb up the ladder of the hunting tower, and then I heard a voice behind me. Hey, where are you going? I turned around. It was my mom's boyfriend behind me, asking where I was going. I didn't know how to say I was following you. I turned back around to look at the hunting tower along the tree line, and nobody was there. Nothing was. Not an animal, not my mother, not a ghost, nothing. Fast forward to a few years ago, my now wife and I were still dating at the time and sharing ghost experiences with one another. I told her about this experience and Monterey, and I'll never forget the look on her face when I told her. She is from a Mexican family as well, and this legend of the witches of Monterey is a very real thing for her as well. The scary part? I was telling her this story on a Friday, and according to what her family told her growing up, Friday is a forbidden day to talk about them because that's one day of the week that they're most powerful. Apparently, they never forget their prey and they use that day as a lure toward what was lost. Initially, I thought, that's BS. But I can't begin to express how many Fridays my wife had to stop me because I would randomly bring up the story. Maybe it was just self-conscious, I don't know. But it still kind of freaks me out to this day. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, 
pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband to work the night shift to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is, and he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace, and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again.